Greetings, it is I, the Great One himself, Cynical Libertarian Society, C-Y-N-L-I-B-S-O-C.com on the internet. Hanging out here with an anarchy moment. Now you're going to notice on this edition of Anarchy Moment and on the next some odd number of editions, I don't know how many I'm going to record right now, that you don't hear the clock in the background and there's a different room tone. By the way, for those of you out there who are interested in getting into audio recording, whether it's for film or for podcasting or whatever, be aware that when you're using a microphone in an environment, there's no such thing as silence. So say, for example, you go into something like Audacity and you're doing some editing and you want to insert some silence into a part of your recording. Silence means that. It means there's no noise whatsoever. So, for example, if I stop talking, what you will hear is not silence. So I'm going to stop talking. Now, what you just heard there isn't actually silence. There's not an absence of noise there. What is actually there is room tone. So if you listen to that, and then like if you cut that little part of this recording out, right, and you say put it into Audacity, and then you insert some silence next to that and you listen to them, you'll actually be able to hear when the silence appears because the room tone will vanish. So why that's important is if you're going to do recording where you're going to do editing of the recording, you should always make sure you capture some room tone with your audio recording. So for example, in the movies, when or film, television, whatever, when, when professional people are doing video, after they've taken some shots on a set or in a location or whatever, the audio guy will always make sure at some point he records at least 30 seconds of room tone, which is just the ambient noise in the room, so that later on during the editing process, if he needs to insert what you can conventionally call silence, but which is not technically silence, if he wants to insert audio in there where you don't hear anybody talking or special effects or whatever it is, he uses the room tone. So another way you can do that, a simple way to do that is when you're doing recording, like I always do, just out of habit, even though I don't necessarily use it, whenever I do Anarchy Moments, I always let the recorder run for 15 to 30 seconds, typically, before I start talking, and then when I'm finished, I'll let it run for usually another 15 to 30 seconds, so I capture my room tone that way. Anyway, room tone is different from silence. If you're going to be editing your audio, make sure in each and every different location where you record audio, make sure you get room tone. It doesn't really have anything to do with anarchy, but every once in a while I like to throw out a tip. You know, it's the Michael W. Dean way of thinking. It's educate people along the way. Speaking of Michael W. Dean, I haven't listened to him much lately just because I've been busy, but I know that Nima Vidati is no longer broadcasting with Michael. Michael is, last I heard, on his own. I don't know if he's picked up another co-host or not or anything yet, but I'm not keeping up on this. So anyway, let's talk about anarchy. More important, more specifically, rather. Let me talk about some things that bitches have done lately to piss me off and how this relates to anarchy. Here's the first one. I'm at a meeting and this woman with tattoos and excessive amounts of body weight is talking about how she's trying to get a grant from the federal government to start a business. It's some kind of online something or something. I don't know exactly what it was and I don't care. All I care about is that she said she hopes she gets the full grant because if she gets the grant and it, it, actually it's not a business she's starting some kind of a website so it's actually not really a business i mean like most websites are always trying to sell something whatever 
but it's not a business per se. It's a website. Anyway, the point is, she says, if she gets the full grant to start this website, she can quit her job. And I thought to myself, great, another fat bitch with tattoos on welfare. One more fucking person that I have to pay for. Jesus fucking H. Christ Almighty. On a stick. Jesus Christ on a stick. Not just Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ on a fucking stick. Another thing that's happened lately from women, which is more disappointing, because this is coming from a woman that I'm friends with and that I have a lot of respect for. But she's doing some stupid shit. Hang on a second. See, that was not room tone because I was making a lot of noise. I'm repositioning myself so I can get better recording. Hang on, you're going to hear microphone noise. Deal with it. Oh yeah, this is much better. Speaking. Remember, when you're speaking, don't be all hunched over because I was fucking hunched over the way that I was sitting. I was sitting in a chair and the microphone was low. Here's another speaking tip. Correct posture is good for your speaking skills. Another thing that's good for your speaking skills, of course, is to warm up your voice before you start speaking, which I didn't do. So I'm going to try to keep this episode short. Also, you can get some good speaking skills from... I'm going to talk about this book in maybe the next episode of Anarchy Moment. I'm currently reading How to Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win Big by Scott Adams. It's a great book. Scott Adams... His, I mean, Dilbert is, of course, a great comic strip, comic strip, if I can talk correctly. But this book is really insightful, and I highly recommend you get a hold of it and read it. And I'm pretty sure I will be talking about it more in the future. So anyway, back to this woman who is just being annoying especially because she's one of the more intelligent people I know, and while she is not by any stretch of imagination an anarcho-capitalist, she is somebody who has a chance of one day pulling her head out of her ass and seeing the truth. She, she's launched this little kick to get people to stop using the internet at home for a whopping five days. And I found it hilarious the way she phrases it in her advertising material as she's trying to draw other people into doing this with her. She says something to the effect of, you know, does it make you nervous to think of going five days without internet? And I'm thinking, and you know, she's like, so this is our challenge. You can use the internet at work but you just can't use the internet at home. And as much as I like and admire this person, I can't help but just look at this and think first world problems. I mean, we... We live in a country, we live in a society, we live in a nation where people act like going without internet at home, only at home, you still get internet at work. Going without internet for a week is this terrifying thing that, you know, she uses the expression somewhere in there, do you get sweaty palms thinking about going without internet? I'm like, no, I get sweaty palms thinking about the government murdering me because I don't advocate murder. People in Afghanistan get sweaty palms thinking about the fact that a robot could come out of the sky and kill them at any moment. People in China get sweaty palms thinking about, you know, doing 16-hour shifts in the 
Apple slave corporate plantations building iPhones. I mean, what? Just, God damn it, it's so fucking hard to take you people seriously with your fucking first world problems. We're going to go a week without, in five days, not even a real week. It's not even like a seven day week. It's five days without internet at home. Oh my gosh. Wow. Oh wow. Wow, just wow. I mean, I appreciate the disconnecting concept. But the need to make an event out of it, you know, and the need to only do it once, it's like instead of not using the internet at home for a week, for five days, it's not a week, it's five days, while still using the internet at work for these five days, I mean, why don't you just make an effort to reduce your overall usage of the internet? Why don't you do something a little more useful? This same person also recently publicized via social media an article on the internet where somebody was writing about this new system for replacing email, which instead of using email for people at work to communicate about job projects, they had a system where it was a long thread where people would post something and then other people posted responses to it. In other words, instead of attempting to replace email with bulletin boards. You know, do, do, do you guys remember bulletin boards? Somebody would post something, then you post a response, and somebody would post a response, and you'd post a response, and you'd post a response. You know, bulletin boards from back in, oh, let's see, 1993, I think, was when I was using my dial-up modem to get to bulletin boards. So we're going to replace email with bulletin boards because that's much more effective. And she was in favor of this. And what you see here, here's ultimately why I bring this up, is that you see the small-minded focus people have. That's kind of insulting, but I just don't care. People focus on the tools and not the systems. People focus on the tool and not the usage. You know, well, we need to replace email. What, with a fucking, with bulletin boards? You don't need to replace email. You need to learn how to use email effectively. You don't need to go five days without internet at home while still using internet at work in order to fucking disconnect or feel good about yourself. You need to learn how to moderate your overall usage of internet. Okay, it's like saying I'm never going to eat chocolate cake again. I mean, that's a stupid idea and you're going to fail. It's better to say I'm going to moderate my eating of chocolate cake. In fact, Scott Adams in this book talks about, among many brilliant things, the book again is called How to Fail at, Every, bleh, how to, how to fail at Talking on Your Podcast. It, Scott Adams' book is called how to fail at almost everything and still win big. In the book, he talks about how it is better to have a system than to have a goal. And it's better to have systems than it is to have goals. Because, of course, with a goal, Anytime you're not obtaining the goal, you're failing. But with a system, anytime you're applying the system, you're winning. So as an example, if you have a goal to lose 10 pounds, you're going to struggle to meet your goal to lose 10 pounds. And then once you've met the goal, you have to get a new goal, or perhaps you're going to gain the 10 pounds back, or what the fuck are you going to do? Whereas if you simply say you have a system of eating less sugar and eating more nutritious food. Every time you have a meal, when you reduce your amount of sugar and you eat fruits and vegetables and meat instead of processed fucking Monsanto shit, 
you've stuck to your system and you have been successful. And your system can continue forever, right? If you have a goal of running five miles three weeks from now, okay, so once three weeks comes and you ran your five miles, well, then what? But if you have a system of going running four days a week and each week increasing the distance you run by half a mile, well, then your system keeps you carrying. There's not a goal. There's not an end point. The system is self-contained. And he makes asserted arguments why he believes that having a system is more conducive to success than having goals. And it's really a fascinating concept to think about. I've been thinking about it a lot because I have systems for some things and goals for some things. And as I look at my own life, it seems like the things where I have systems tend to work out better. For example, with the podcasting, I've gotten around to releasing an episode of Stating the Obvious or Anarchy Moment every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, except for right now while my computer is being fixed, which of course, I didn't even tell this story. This is why you're hearing different background noise than normal. I am recording this episode and the next couple of episodes of Anarchy Moment. I'm going to bang out a number of episodes right here now. But these are being recorded in a different room from where Randy and I normally record Stating the Obvious and where I normally record Anarchy Moment. because So the computer, the main computer we use for recording, one of the hard drives took a shit, which pissed me off because it's only a year old, so I'm hoping it's still under warranty and I can get a replacement. And I've been dealing with that. So here's, <laughs> so here's our other lesson. I'll come back to talking about systems in a minute. Let me make a note. System three cast a week. We're, we're doing, I'm doing parentheses now like I normally do. It's a thought within a thought. So the hard drive bites the dust. And I'm like, ah, oh, fuck. And I got to get to work. I got something. I got a theater gig going on. I got to fucking get there. So I'm like, all right, I need to order a new hard drive and get it on the way so it'll show up. So I jump on the fucking internet, go to Newegg, which is where I buy a lot of my computer stuff. And I find a hard drive and I'm looking at it. It's like, yeah, it looks great. Okay, I order the fucking thing. The hard drive shows up. Apparently, because I was in a rush because I was trying to do shit quick, because I was cutting corners, because I wasn't paying attention to detail. I remember back in the old days, when we had to walk uphill to get to computers, they had the IDE interface. And then along came the SATA, S-A-T-A, and I kept screwing up and buying IDE shit instead of S-A-T-A, once I had a S-A-T-A. And then they stopped making IDE shit, and I'm like, oh, fine, finally, now I can just buy a fucking hard drive and it'll work. Well, apparently, now, there's a new goddamn fucking connection for hard drives and computers. It's like SCSI something something, but it's not SATA. It's S something fucking else. And the hard drive that I ordered shows up, and it's the wrong fucking connector. God fucking damn it and hell. Wrong fucking thing. So I'm sitting here waiting for this thing to show up so that I can fix the computer. The fucking thing shows up. It's the wrong fucking connector. Because why? Because I did shit in a hurry and I didn't pay attention to detail. The motto of today's story is don't get in a fucking hurry. Pay attention to detail. You'll save yourself a lot of fucking grief down the road. I didn't do that. And now, so then I got that. I'm all pissed off. So I'm like, fuck this. I walk four blocks away to the computer store, go in there, buy a goddamn hard drive, come home, stick it in the fucking computer and start doing the recovery process. The recovery process is still ongoing. The hard drive that died, I attempted a couple of other times to boot it up and access it to get the data off. It would not boot up. It had invalid boot sectors and assorted other errors. 
So I'd mostly given up on it, but I dropped it into an external dock just to see what would happen, and damn if the fucking thing didn't fire up. So I am currently getting all the data off of the old hard drive onto a backup hard drive, and then I'll be restoring it, so it's going to be a process. The point is, I could have had this done days ago, if, of course, maybe, instead of just even trying to order the hard drive off the internet, maybe I should have just fucking walked four blocks away to the computer store and bought a hard drive there. But no, no, I didn't do that, because I was a fucking dumbass, and then I ordered the wrong hard drive because I didn't pay attention to detail. So, fucking pay attention to detail. So that's why there have been no podcasts this week. And by this week, I mean, what is this? Today is like the 17th or some shit. I don't even know what it is. Who cares? Nobody gives a fuck. Anyway, the point is there's been a week without podcast, and this is why. Podcast, in theory, should resume on Monday. So let's talk about podcasting as we close these parentheses. See, I did not set a goal of publishing a podcast every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I implemented a system because a goal has, has some sort of an endpoint. A system doesn't. And people could say, well, but you have a goal of pu- publishing the podcast every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I mean, you know, you're, you're arguing semantics, and Scott Adams actually makes the same argument. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of semantics here, but a goal is something that we're going to say has an endpoint, such as I'm going to lose 10 pounds, whereas a system is something that has no endpoint. So when you say, well, I'm going to publish the podcast every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, that's not really a goal because there is no single endpoint where you say, oh, I've successfully accomplished this. Because if you do it on Monday and then Wednesday and then Friday, well, next week you're going to have another Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So that's a system. It's not a goal. And so all of this obsession people have, like my friend who wants to not use the internet at home for five days and wants bulletin boards to replace emails. No, it, it, the reason for this is because this person doesn't have a system. If you're using the internet too much, have a system of not using the internet as much. It's like people with their cell phones who just can't leave without the cell phone. Right? I have a system. My system says if I'm going somewhere and I don't really think I'm going to need a cell phone and I'm not at that time on call for any of my gigs or expecting somebody I really need to talk to to contact me, my system is that I leave my fucking cell phone at home because I'm not a 14-year-old girl and I can fucking walk out my front door and go do shit without having to have my fucking cell phone because God forbid... You know, I, I may not be able to send a fucking Snapchat of my fucking cunt or something. Whatever the fuck 14-year-old girls do with cell phones. I don't know why 14-year-olds would need a cell phone, but that's just me. So all of these these goals, like going five days without internet at home or replacing email with bulletin boards. Let's replace email with some 1994 technology. Fuck yes. First of all, these are goals. They're not systems. They're not addressing the real problem. The real problem is that people are misusing the tools and not misusing in a morally wrong way, but simply you know, if you've reached this point where you're like, well, I need to disconnect from the internet for five days, well, that means you've been doing it wrong up until then. You need to have a system where you continuously moderate your use of the internet. If you, for whatever reason, can't deal can't deal with email, then create a system of utilizing your email that works for you. And I don't want to say this doesn't mean technology shouldn't move forward and something else in one day shouldn't maybe replace email, but I mean, God damn it, bulletin boards, really? That's the fucking replacement for email. And of course, to get to the bulletin board, 
you're going to have to log in, right? What are you going to log in with? Well, you're going to have to fucking log in with your email address or your cell phone number, which is just a replacement, right? I remember when people, people past conversations, people have talked about, well, but like, will Facebook replace email? And it's like, well, no, because you have to log into Facebook with your email address. And then, of course, now Facebook allows you to log in with your phone number. But your phone number is still fulfilling the same purpose as an email address. You still have to have it. And, of course, since phones have text messaging, so instead of you getting an email to your computer, you get a text message to your cell phone. It's the same fucking thing, people. It's the same fucking thing thing. It's not about the tools. The problem is not the tools. The problem, whatever problem my friend is trying to solve, solved, <laughs> whatever problem my friend is trying to solve, whatever problem my friend is trying to solve by going without internet at home for five days, and replacing email, it's not going to be solved by doing those things. The problem will only be solved by addressing the root cause of the problem. It's just like the state. You can't solve the problem of the state by passing laws or protesting or voting for some douchebag, or any of these other things. You can only solve the problem of the state by addressing the root core. The root core being, of course, that the vast majority of people want to be slaves. Coupled with the fact that the vast majority of people who want to be slaves are doing most of the reproducing coupled with the fact that we live in a democracy, making air quotes in the air, which means that the stupid people, the people who want to be slaves, will always be able to crush the competent people beneath their body weight. No matter how incompetent the parasitical class is, the parasitical class, you know, the fat women with tattoos who want a government grant to start a website so she can quit her job, the parasites will always outnumber the producers and they will drag the producers down and destroy them. And it's, I'm sorry that it's pessimistic. I wish it wasn't true, but I'm, I'm realistic. That's why this is called the cynical libertarian society, not the optimistic libertarian society. Those of us who are competent, or, and even those of us who simply want to be competent or striving to be competent, may not be competent yet, but would like to be competent, we will always be crushed by the parasites. The parasites will always bury us beneath the weight of their fat, tattooed bodies. <laughs>